congratulations on your new Platinum camper and welcome to the Platinum family. Now, I know it's really exciting to buy a new camper trailer and you're pumped to come pick it up, but before you come and collect it, there's just a few things that you need to be aware of so that you're safe out on your travels. As standard, all Platinum camper trailers include electric brakes. You just need a way to control them. And by law, you will require an electric brake controller either on your vehicle or mounted to the tow vehicle. If it's in your vehicle, generally speaking, it could be a red arc system or something similar, and you may have a little dial on your dashboard. That's one way to tell. If unsure, check with the dealer that sold you your car or head to an auto electrician and they'll be able to tell you you've got one, or if not, they'll be able to install one for you and give you a quote. The option that we can offer you is a trailer mounted electric brake controller by Elect Brakes. This is mounted onto the drawbar of your vehicle and runs in through the seven pin plug. You'll need an app on your phone to control it, which allows you to adjust the, the strength of the braking up or down. Um, one of the reasons you would need that is let's say when you hit the brakes on your vehicle, you notice that the brakes on the trailer are engaging a little slow and you, you get a bit of a, a kick up the bump, right? If you're starting to feel that, you need to make your brakes a little bit tighter. And the opposite of that is also true, that if you feel the car sort of get pulled back, the brakes are engaging too quickly and you'll just need to lower that setting a little bit. Once you find the sweet point, generally you won't have to change that too often. You may need to change it if you're going down some very steep hills. Um, you might have to tighten it up a little bit, but other than that, generally speaking, you'll just be able to leave that. To turn on the electric brakes unit, all you'll need to do is turn on your parkers or the headlights on your vehicle, turn on the app and make sure that it is a big blue tick. If it's not a big blue tick, check your Bluetooth settings as a first point of call, make sure they're turned on and that your device is discoverable. Make sure your headlights are on and try again. Now, if it's not working after that, you may need a little bit more support, so give us a call. So now that we've finished learning about the brake controller, it's time for you to come and pick up your camper trailer. So, it's the big day, it's time to pick up your camper. Now, first thing we're gonna have to look at is to make sure that your tow bar is fitted, you have a tow tongue, and it is ready for a hitch receiver. Also, check that your trailer plug is in good working condition. If picking up from a Platinum Campus showroom or from one of our dealers, the team will install the new polyblock hitch receiver for you. However, if you're picking it up from one of our depots, you will need to bring along some tools, you know, something like a rattle gun or a big wrench to help you remove your tow ball and to install the new polyblock hitch. Now, let's show you how that's done. So here's some tips to get off your old tow ball and to install your new polyblock hitch. The most easy way to do this, fingers crossed you may have a rattle gun at home, is to simply hold your tow ball, use the rattle gun, and off it comes. Now let's say that tow ball is just spinning in your hand and you can't get a good grab on it. Your next step is to use a pipe wrench or something similar to grab that tow ball, then use your rattle gun again and give that a crack. Let's say you don't have a rattle gun. All is good, just use a 300 mil or 12 inch wrench and it does the same thing. Now, depending on the age of your tow ball, it may be very, very tight. We've seen some very tight ones in our time and sometimes they just don't wanna give. Look, it's time to get creative. Try some WD-40. If that doesn't work, it's time to head to the mechanic and get them to remove it for you. If they can't, I just hate to say it, but it's time to buy a new tongue. Now that we have the ball removed, it's time to install your new polyblock hitch receiver. This is your polyblock hitch receiver. This is a spring washer, and that is your nut. Basically, we're gonna put it onto the tow tongue, and we tighten it until that spring washer compresses and becomes flat. So, without further ado, your first step is put your new hitch receiver in, and make sure, make sure those two little lips are securely on either side of the tongue. Put on your washer, and add the nut. Due to the length of the thread, you unfortunately won't be able to use your rattle gun for this and you'll just have to use your wrench and just tighten it until that spring washer becomes flat. That way, it won't be as hard to remove next time. All Platinum Campers come standard with an articulated poly block hitch. Now what articulated means is that it has a full range of 360 degree motion this way and a great up and down motion as well. This is fantastic because when you're towing your camper behind you, this is a lot more forgiving than a standard tow ball. Also, in the event of a catastrophe like falling asleep while driving, something like this may be the difference between saving your life and not. 
If your camper, you know, unfortunately happens to spin, well, the good news is the car won't tip as well because the camper has a full range of motion. So we believe polyblock hitches are the way to go. However, if you do prefer a tow ball, this is an option at the time of purchase. Now it's time for the fun part. We're gonna hook up your camper. I've got my colleague Mac here and he's gonna give us a hand. So step one, come over to your polyblock hitch and remove the polyblock hitch pin. Next, jump into your tow vehicle and reverse up to your new hitch. Once you've got these two close, your next step is you need to align the polyblock hitch with the hitch receiver. Noticing that it's a little bit too low at the moment, use your jockey wheel to get it level. And once you're about right, you can pull your camper closer to the hitch. Once you've got your hitch inside the hitch receiver, chuck your pin in and then insert the safety pin on the bottom. The next step is to cross your chains and to connect them to your vehicle. Now the safety of you and your family is the most important part here. The chains are crossed over to provide a cradle in case the camper becomes loose from your car and falls towards the ground. If it falls, those chains will act as a cradle, stopping it from hitting the ground and potentially flipping over onto your car. So it's a very important and even a legal requirement. After your camper is hitched up and the chains are connected, it's time to connect your trailer plug. In our case, we're using a seven pin flat plug. You may have a round or a round large. Either way, they all work the same. Once plugged in, check your tail lights, your indicator lights, and that the brake controller is communicating with your vehicle. And while here, if you do have one, it's time to plug in the Anderson plug so that your batteries will charge while driving. Now that everything's connected, it's time to raise your jockey wheel so that you lower the camper and your tow vehicle can take the weight. When you lower the jockey wheel, make sure that the brackets are seated into these little grooves and that'll make sure that the wheel cannot move during travel. After this, pull the handle and flip up the jockey wheel. Make sure that the jockey wheel is facing you so that when you flip it up, it's sitting behind the stone guard facing out. Lastly, make sure that the handle is resting on your drawbar so that it doesn't have a chance of falling off and flipping around. One extra tip. If you lower your jockey wheel all the way down and you find that you can't flip it up because the camper's weight is still being supported by that wheel, what that means is that your tow tongue is not high enough. Now, there's a couple of options here. The most basic being, sometimes you may be able to flip that tongue and that may give you just a little bit of extra height and enough room to, to lift the jockey wheel. However, if that's not enough, then unfortunately, I would recommend getting an adjustable height tongue because that will be able to give you the extra height required for you to be able to lower that jockey wheel. Your next step is to disengage your handbrake by simply pushing in the button on the top and lowering it down. So I have my other colleague Aaron here for the last step. We're gonna check your wheel nuts. Now this is most likely the first trip away on your new camper and it is highly recommended, if not essential, that you double check the wheel nuts are torqued to the right setting. With alloy wheels, you need to make sure that they are torqued to 140 newton meters, and with steel wheels, that needs to be torqued to 150 newton meters. And one tip here is to tighten them up in a star pattern, top, bottom, left, right, etc. And this just makes sure that the tire is embedded onto the wheel hub properly. Now it's important to note that this is a brand new trailer, and new wheel nuts and new wheel hubs will go through an embedding process. So please check them at the first 50 kilometers, your first 100, your first 200, and after that, before every single trip you take away. The very last thing we're gonna do is check your tire pressures. In most cases, and when on the road, you wanna set that at 40 PSI. Now, if you're heading to the beach, you can lower that down to between 15 or 20 PSI, and that'll make for a much, much safer and easy drive on the sand. And now that all that's sorted, it's time to start your next adventure. Let's go. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into the Chase Camper so that you can learn about all of its features and use it more confidently on your next trip. So, without further ado, let's get started. So now, we're going to take a look at the 12 volt power management system on a Chase Camper. This is a waterproof isolator switch and turns everything on on the camper. So you flick this up, and when you're not using it anymore, push this button in, and that'll turn everything back off. When this is on, the camper is now drawing power from your batteries. So, what else does everything here do? First, we have a volt meter. Now this volt meter will give you an idea of how many volts the battery is currently putting out. If it ever does get below 12, that's an indication that it is now time to charge your batteries. If it is above 12, 
you're good to go. Next, we have a voltmeter and an amp meter. This is combined, and you'll notice that the 13.3 is very similar to this charge up here. The amps at the moment is showing zero because the camper isn't actually drawing anything, or very minimal to just power this little display here. When the camper starts using power for your fridges and you know, any other devices you have plugged in, you'll start noticing the amperage go up. Next, we've got a water gauge. This shows you how much water is left in your water tank. This is an Anderson plug. Now this Anderson plug is quite cool because it can operate as an input or an output. So you can either charge a fridge from it or you can plug a solar panel into it. Lastly, we have our individual isolator switches. Now each one of these will turn something on on your camper. The first set turns on your lights. The second set turns on your water pump, which we're gonna leave off for now. Um, and the third set turns on your accessories. So this is your uh, 12 volt power supplies and your USB power supply plugs. Now on the Chase Camper, there is one spare. Depending on any optional extras you get, you may have something here, but as standard, it is a spare. So let's say something's gone wrong with the camper. Maybe you've plugged in too many devices and you've overloaded the, the circuit. Your first point of call you can take this cover off and there are some resettable switches in here. These fuses generally are gonna be your problem if you've overloaded that circuit. So just press that and that'll reset your fuse. So next up are jerry can holders. This is a standard 20 liter jerry can and it will fit quite snugly into the provided jerry can holder. This latch secures it in place. You push it over and lock it down. Now that felt a bit loose to me, so what we're going to do is tighten it up by pulling it back out. You just screw the latch in a little bit more and try it again. Ah, much better. And lastly, if you wanted to lock this, you can use a padlock through this little hole here and that'll lock in your latch. Following on from the jerry can holder, let's look at the gas bottle holder. It's very similar in design. It takes a nine kilo standard gas bottle. Make sure when you put it in, the gas nozzle is facing your regulator. That'll just slide right on in. And same as your jerry can holders, the latch just goes over this cover and locks down. Now if it feels a bit loose, same as the other one, just tighten it up and latch it back down. And now it's a bit tighter. Next up, you're gonna connect your gas. So make sure it's turned off. Now with the thread on this, just remember it is opposite than most of the other threads in the world. So lefty, loosey, righty, tidy, this is Righty loosey, lefty tidy. So we'll put that in. And then turn on your gas. So, just a quick one here. This is where we fill up the water tank. It is secured with a latch with a key. Now this key has a little trick to it. There's a little black cover over that keyhole, which stops dirt and dust from getting in. You need to push it aside with the key and then put your key in, okay? Just one more time, you push it in and then all the way in and then you can turn it and take your water cap off. And then of course, put it back on, lock it back up, and you're secure. Now, we're gonna move on to how to set up your main tent. By now, you should have already leveled the camper and dropped your stabilizer legs. Once that's done, you can move on to unlatching the top. The latches with these red covers, they have a little tab on the side to act as a security device. You've got to push that in and pull it up and then drop down your latch. The black ones don't have that little tab, so they just unlatch like so. And then you do the same on the other side. Remembering the little tab on these ones. Once that's done, head over to your winch. Our winch is here to make opening the top very, very easy. Your first step is to give yourself a little bit of slack. You want to give yourself enough so that when you lift the roof, it catches. That should be enough. So after you've given yourself a little bit of slack, it's time to lift the lid. Now this lid is on gas struts, so it is very, very light and can be done with just one hand. Give it a bit of a push, walk down with it so it's easier and wait for it to catch onto the winch. Beautiful. Now that it's done that, you can just wind it down. The good thing about the Chase Camper is all of the internal structure, you do not need to adjust. It just flops open and there's just a couple of poles to complete the setup. Once it sort of hits the bottom, give yourself a fair bit of extra slack and I'll show you why in a moment. So now the roof is down and we have the floor level, we've got to put some poles up. So come on in here. Now that we're inside, we recommend leaving your sort of most important poles 
easily accessible so you don't have to go searching for them when you rock up at camp. Number one, grab your number six poles. This will go in the corners. And then extend the pole. Do the same with the other side. Next number six pole. And this goes into the other corner of the camper. Now just a little tip here. On this side of the camper, this is the side that the annex is installed on. You'll see a little nut here. Make sure that you keep this pole far away from that nut so that you can hook up your annex. Next two poles are the ones over your bed. These are the number seven poles. I'm just gonna grab both of them and let's go put them in. With your number sevens, put them to the ground first and then lift them up. Now, there is a spreader bar that can go between this middle pole and this one here. So make sure you give yourself enough room. I recommend putting these poles to the side so that you can attach your spreader here. Do the same on the other side. Make them nice and tight. Your goal here is to stop any sort of pooling of water. So make sure your tent top is very taut. Next, we grab these last two number four poles. These are called spreader bars. Now in all seriousness, if you were just stopping for an overnight trip, I probably wouldn't even bother with these. But if you're expecting rain, maybe a lot of wind or a storm coming through, definitely put them in. What you do, grab your pole, look for the long side and push that into that top bar. The reason we do that is so that this nut is easily accessible. Extend it and put that onto the back bar and tighten. Do the same on the other side. And voila, you've set up your camper. Now, if you are expecting rain or some heavy rain, we do recommend adding some extra number four poles or spreader bars and number five poles onto your tent. You can just add them between here and here, here, and here, and even on the corners there and there. The main goal is you don't want pooling water. You want the water to run off in rain, and if you can do that, it's gonna greatly extend the life of your canvas. While inside the tent, there are these two Velcro straps. And what this does is this kind of seals up the camper a little bit from the outside world. The easiest way to do it is if you have two people, one person can stand on the outside holding one side of the Velcro while the other one pushes it in. Now, if you like me and you're by yourself today, here's a way to do it. Open up your window. Sometimes during the pack down, this strip can move a little bit, right? That is by design. Just make sure it's lined up with the top here and lined up with the bottom there. And that'll make this part a whole lot easier. So one hand on the outside, one hand on the inside, and then just Velcro your way up. It is just designed to sort of keep the elements out and the bugs out. It does a pretty good job. So that side's now done. We'll come over to the other side and we'll do that one as well. Your last step for your main tent is this little convenient piece of canvas. This covers up the hole between the camper and the floor. There are magnets on either side, magnet, magnet, and that just slots down like so over that middle hole. And while we're in here, might as well mention the step. This is the step to get into bed. There's nothing too exciting here. It closes, it opens. Just make sure you keep it closed when you're packing up the camper. Now that we've finished on the inside, the last little step is just to tidy up the canvas. Just pull everything over the, uh, the, the frame. Just make sure it's all nice and tight. There's a little zip here. Again, this just tightens everything up around the camper. And of course, do the same on the other side. So, just a little tip on how to roll up your windows nice and tight. Unzip them all the way to the top. Pull it out. Make some little triangles. Like so. Like that. And then, start rolling from the bottom nice and tight. I'll give you a nice tight roll, which you can then secure with the straps provided. And of course, you can do the same for your midi screens. So with your door, same thing. Look for the zipper, which of course is the last place you look. <laughs> Unzip it. 
pull it out like so. Now with this one, I find you just sort of drop it like that. Make that same triangle and then just roll it in. You sort of roll from the bottom to the top. Done. Now, you may remember from the start of the video, I said leave yourself a bit of slack on the winch. This is the reason why, so that it can go over your whole tent while it's set up. We recommend just leaving it here so that you don't have to throw it back over and try and connect it when you want to leave. And this way, when you are ready to leave, you can just wind the thing up. Now, let me show you how to open the back door and fold that one up nice and tight as well. Same idea as your windows. You want to create two nice big V's. And just roll that up. And again, you can do the same thing with the screens. The lights in the camper, your light strips here, 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 and here, and the light outside above your kitchen are all controlled via this remote control. Now, don't forget, you do need to turn on your isolator switch and your individual accessories light switch before this will work. But once you've done that, you should just be able to switch everything on. Don't lose this remote control. It's paired with the LED control box, and if you lose it, you need to replace that whole kit, which can become quite expensive. Um, the LED lights are connected through this little junction here. If something were to go wrong, this would be the first place I'd check, just to make sure that's nice and tight, because over time, it can become a little bit loose. Now, we're going to do a setup of the annex on a chase. Step one, grab your manual and get your tent map guide. After this, grab out all the required poles and lay them out on the floor in the right space, like where you need them to be. So, the best piece of advice that I can give you when setting up your annex is be methodical. Start from one end and work your way through. Start building it low and then lift it up. So, without further ado, let's get started. So you start off with a number nine pole. These have a little hook on them. Get up on your stool here. And you may remember from previously in the video, I pointed out these little nuts. This hook will go in here and go inside that nut. Cool, get that in and then just let that dangle like so. One other little piece, one other little tip is make sure the screw for those poles is facing down. You don't want them facing up into the canvas, you want them facing down so that you can access them. Then we move on to the next one. This is also a number nine pole with a hook. Same dealio, there's a little nut up here that you just want to hook into. And then just let it dangle. Now this last step, this is a little bit different. On a chase, there's a little pocket here. Lift that up. The bottom of pole number 13 sits in there and we'll go up into here. Now we'll come back to this bit later, but for now, just leave that. Nice and tight, like so. But we'll come back to that in a moment. So, now that we've done that, what we need to do is we need to zip on the roof. So, we're gonna grab our roof. This is the big gray one. And we're gonna lay that out. Oh, so the zipper is over here. I'm just gonna lay that out, like so. Now this is easier with two people. You can have one person hold up the roof while the other person zips it on, but you can do it by yourself also. So get on your stool, this little bit, flip this up. You see how it's over my head? You bring it over and just drop that little receiver into the zip there. And then start zipping her on. Make sure you're over the poles. Get that over. and zip that all the way. Next step, we need to put up the stand poles. So, this bit can get a little tricky for your first time, but trust me, you get pretty good after, after a couple of attempts. What we need to do is we need to connect this number nine pole to the number 10 pole 
and connect the number 10 pole to the number eight pole. So extend this out until you roughly get to the eyelet and then lock it off. Next, grab your number 10 pole and your number eight pole. Again, making sure that your little screws are always facing down. Put that on here. Get your little helper to hold it <laughs> while you connect it into here. Like that. And that goes into the eyelet. Sweet. And that's number one. Now while you're here, just so things are a bit easier to deal with, there's little straps underneath that will secure the tent top to the poles. So we just put the Velcro on like this. And look, this is just loose for now. Um, we'll tighten everything up at the end. Move on to the middle pole, another number nine. Loosen up your number nine pole. Bring it roughly to the eyelet and then tighten it up. Put these Velcro straps on just to hold everything in place. Great, and then grab your next number eight and number 11 pole. The number 11 pole is your tallest one. This will connect onto the last number eight, which will just loosen up a little. Whoop. Connect it there. Connect it to the next number eight pole. And onto your number nine. Whoop. Whoop. And this will go through your eyelet. There we go. And now we're on to the last one. So your little helper, now we'll now move down and hold on to the next one. <laughs> Loosen up this number eight. Pull it down to the eyelet. And tighten it off. Now, this next one may seem a little tricky, but it's not that difficult. Grab this number eight. And now you remember the number 13 from before. Pull that back down. Connect it in. And then put your number 13 back through that eyelid. Now just make this as tight as possible. Just trying to make everything nice and taut. And tighten it off. Loosen your number eight. Come down to that final eyelid. Grab your last number 10 pole and thread them through. And you're almost done. Get that through the eyelet. Great. And of course, attach these um, Velcro straps. So now, you're basically finished with your little helper and you have your annex down nice and low. Now what you need to do is to sort of raise everything and tighten it up. So let's go do that. So the reason we build it low is so you can reach all the poles. So now that everything's put together, start tightening everything up. And we'll do this a couple of times just till we get it right. So tighten this one. Basically what you're looking for is you need this tent to be tight. So let's make it nice and tight. Screw it in and do the same with your other poles. So make that nice and tight. Same with this one over here, just like so. Cool. And next, we start raising the tent. Basically, you want it level with your camper. Raise up the middle. Keeping this section now level. I can see we need to tighten here. And your last one. I think we can go a bit higher. Up there. Come back over to your middle. 
last little step is just grab these and secure them to the little hole in the pole. This will just tighten up your tent and make sure it doesn't blow around in the wind. Just make sure that the Velcro strap across the roof has been folded back over and pushed down. You can sort of just push up through the bottom here and that'll connect it. Underneath the bed in your camper, you'll find this bag. Inside this bag is all your tent pegs, your tent ropes, and these little rubber grommets. What are these for? Let me show you. So these little rubber grommets sit between the stand poles and your canvas tent top. Just drop them down like that, and that'll stop the water from running in through that eyelet there. Now that your roof is completely up, your last step is chuck some spreader poles in there. Now look, they're not 100% required, but if you are gonna be experiencing rain or you're even expecting any rain, we highly recommend them, because what they'll do is they'll help stop pooling on your annex roof. So, little tip, grab your pole, grab the long end, and use that to go for your middle. Connect it, come over here to the other end, connect, and extend. And do the same on the other side. Again, always making sure that these are not facing the canvas and are facing you. Cool. Now that we've done that, another little tip for rain. If you are going to be experiencing some heavy rain, what we recommend is actually dropping one of the sides of your annex. What that'll do is that'll help the water run off much faster than if you had left it up as normal. So just drop one of your sides just by using this front pole, just lower it a little bit, and that'll help create a lot of runoff and won't allow pooling to happen on the top of your roof. As standard, your annex does include walls, floor, and a draft skirt. Let's show you how to put those on. Now normally, I do recommend putting on the front first. It does have some extra Velcro straps for the wall to keep everything in place. Having said that, you can just use the walls also. So, let's grab that front out. You'll know which one's the front, because it's got a zipper on it. So, let's find the zipper. Here it is. Move that back to the start. Play this out like you did your roof. We're going to come over here to the zipper and connect this. And zip it on. And zip all the way. Now that your wall's on, you may notice this little lip. This little lip is the uh, Velcro strap for your walls. But before we do that, there's just a couple more things we need to do to the front. Come down to the bottom here and put your pole on top of this PVC floor. That will just tighten everything up and also lined it up a lot better for you. Just give yourself a little bit of room and follow it along. Come to the middle one, pull out your little skirting. This is also a good way to see if the height of your annex is correct because it should line up quite well with the ground. This center pole here is connected on via Velcro straps. So, keep pulling out that floor, or skirt. And just give everything a nice little tap down. We're gonna put one of the walls on. So, grab a wall. These are quite easy. They're just connected by Velcro. And just make sure you got it the right way out with the insect screens facing in and the canvas facing out. So, come over here. Start at one of your corners. Just line it up with Velcro strap. I like to go along the top first, just sort of holds everything in place a bit nicer. Right. Now once we get to this corner, just go around that pole a little bit, 
and just keep connecting that down. come back to the front side and just finish off connecting this Velcro together. Tap down your floor, pull out the lip. Now over here, what you'll see, you'll see this now conveniently, folds into a nice square, like so, and you'll now have a good point to put that tent pole into, right in the corner there. With the chase, if you want to use the wall that is on the same side as the kitchen, you will need to use your draft skirt. A draft skirt is designed to cover up all this so that your main annex area isn't exposed to the elements. So it's nice and easy. As you can see, there's Velcro all the way along here and that's where it connects to. So we'll open that out. As with last time, I like to start at the top, just line it up and push it down. So notice just here, it's a little lip and that slips on right there. This zip here, this is so you can access your kitchen while the draft skirt is on. And then when you're not using it, you can close it back up to seal up the space. Cool, come over to this side and then just keep bulk rowing that all the way down. And again, Tap everything down here and make sure that lip is nice and sturdy on the ground. Now that we've got that, we have this extra bit of Velcro here to support the side wall. Let's put that on. Beautiful. Now, I'm just gonna jump back inside the camper and straighten out that bottom. If using your walls and floors of the annex, it is highly recommended that you use the tent pegs along the bottom of the tent. What you'll find is these little black straps. These little black straps are designed for your tent pegs. We recommend going in on a nice angle like so, grab your trusty mallet and whack it in. Our very last step. If you're using the roof of the annex or the walls and floors, either way, we do highly recommend you tie it down. Inside that little bag we showed you before, there's a lot of these tie down ropes, which have a little tightener on one end, and I've just tied a little knot in the other end. Simply loop that over the top. Now we usually put two on there, going to two different angles. We'll go one coming out here. Doesn't have to be too tight right now because we're going to tighten it in a minute. Again, same as what we did over there, put it on an angle, give it a little push, and then hammer the bugger in. Once you've got it in, use this and give it a bit of a tighten. It's nice and tight, great. Let's do the next one. Same deal, come over here, loop it on, tuck on an angle, push it down, and give her a hammer. Once she's in, give her a tighten. So, once you finish tightening this one, do them on the other side. Now, I want to show you one more thing. We've got two tie down points here on either side of the camper. Now, what they're designed for is, look, if you've got a really big storm coming, we recommend maybe adding a couple extra of these tie down ropes. Also, maybe you're using a gazebo just to give yourself a bit extra room. This gives you a point to tie down those on too as well. So, one other little option is if you wanted, you can add a floor. The floor is very easy to connect. There is a Velcro strap all the way around the camper. And the floor also has a Velcro strap which connects. So, let's open her up and show you how that works. Lay it out, come in your corners, and just start connecting it up.
All right, so that concludes the complete setup of the main tent, the roof of the annex, the walls and floor, and draft skirt. So, it's the end of your camping trip and you're ready to go home. What do you gotta to do to pack up? Well, look, number one, you wanna pack it up when it's as dry as possible. Sometimes you're not gonna be able to do that, it might still be raining. Look, that's okay. Pack it up the best you can, and when you get home and it's, and it's sunny again, open it up and let everything dry out, okay? One of your biggest enemies with canvas tents is water, heat, and time. You put those three together, you're almost guaranteed mold, no matter how good the canvas is and no matter how much preparation you've given it. So, when you get home, let it dry out. But, for packing up, it really is just a matter of unzipping and unvelcroing. So, let's get to it. Now that we've got the annex all down, it's time to close up the main tent. Your first step is simply remove those poles that we put in at the start. Now, a little tip, we like to leave those poles easily accessible, and right here, in front of your bed, is a great place for that. Now, you can leave your bed made in a chase camper. Because it's a rear fold, the bed stays flat. However, maybe not the pillows. So now we've got those done, last two poles, your two number sixes at the front. Now what's gonna happen here is your roof is gonna fall down. So once it's done, we'll get out. So that's gonna drop. Before winching it back up, leave one door open. This allows the air to escape when you're closing it, but also makes it much easier to get inside next time you go camping. Last thing, just come around like we did before, just loosen everything back up. So you pull that all back up. Remember this zip here? Just push that in. Don't be neat about it, just sort of un unhook it. So now that's all done, we can winch the floor back up. One last thing. While you're winching, if you do have a second person, it's great to have them walk around the camper and just tuck the canvas in while you're pulling the floor down. If you're by yourself, just stop at a couple of points and do it yourself. I'll be doing it alone today, so you can watch me do it. Now you don't have to be neat here. Just jam it in there. The lid will just start falling. So go around, push it down, go through, and just tuck everything, last little bit in. Again, you don't have to be neat about this, just get it in there. Then pull it down, give it a little shove just to get the air out. Um, start with your back latch. This will sort of pull that roof forward. Just down, oh, down there like that. Again, if it is a little tight, because that did feel a little bit tight, you can loosen these or tighten them just by screwing this in and out. Come around and do it on the other side. And now you clip in these red ones. Tighten this back up. Leave it connected so it's easy to use next time. Now, we just go around and raise those uh, stabilizer legs. Now that your camp is fully packed down and you wanna leave camp, last thing to remember, make sure everything is locked, everything is latched down, 
In fact, if you want to be completely safe, I would even lock all of the doors that you can. But most importantly, just make sure your kitchen is locked in place. There's nothing worse than turning a corner and having this thing fly out. So make sure it's locked in. Shut your toolbox, latch all the locks. Turn your gas off. I'd even recommend unplugging it and you're good to go. Well, we're back in the showroom and I'm in front of one of our hard floor campers and we're gonna show you how to use the kitchen. The good news is all of the hard floor range use a similar kitchen that operate in the same way. Without further ado, I'm gonna leave you with my colleague Bianca, our resident gas expert, and she's gonna show you how to operate your kitchen. Thanks, Steve. Nice, thanks guys. So let's start with the basics on how to open your kitchen. You notice that there's a T-bar here. So all you're gonna do is pull down and turn and it will open. You'll see two blue tabs on the side. You need to push both of them down at the same time and slowly pull out. Once you get all the way out, what you wanna do is give it a little bit more of a pull to lock those brakes in. You hear that clicking noise? That means it's locked in. So when you first open, you will notice a protective cover over the top. You can either keep this or discard it. It's totally up to you. So you'll notice four foam inserts covering the components of your kitchen. You need to keep these. They help protect your kitchen during transport from getting damaged. Before you light your burners, you do need to remove the foam inserts. So I'll give you a quick demo on how to do that. So you just pick up the burner grates and you place them on top of each other. So that way you don't actually damage any other part of your kitchen. Then you just pick that one back up, put them back here, and do the same once again. Pretty easy. Once you remove the foam inserts, just make sure that every single burner and its little bits are all sitting in their correct grooves and lined up. Otherwise, you may have lighting issues. Now that you've got your kitchen ready to light, you can actually hook your bayonet hose up to the onboard gas system. I'll show you how. So down here, you will notice a little black cap. It can be a little bit tight to get off the first couple of times. So just give it a little good wiggle. And once it does come off, it's on a chain, so you can't lose it. Then if you just pop your head in underneath here, you'll find your bayonet hose. So you'll notice on your hose, you'll have a little L-shaped groove. All you have to do is line that up with the little tabs inside. So push him in, give him a turn, and that's ready. Once you've done this, you can now go turn the gas on. The trailers have a regulator on them. So that regulates the amount of gas that's going to the burners. So when you turn your gas bottle on, you only need to do about a half a turn and that should give you sufficient enough gas to run your kitchen burners. Your cooker is now ready to light. There is a lot of air in the line and you will need to flush that out every time you hook the bayonet hose up. It's not gonna be something that's gonna happen straight away. It will take a while for the gas to travel from the bottle through the line to the kitchen. Let me show you how to flush the air out of the line. It's pretty simple. Select your smallest burner, turn the knob to the biggest flame, wait till you can smell the gas. This may take a while until you can actually start smelling gas. And once you do, just push down on the knob again and you'll hear the selfie lighter and the burner should light. Now that you've lit in the small burner, you can go ahead and light whichever burner that you require. Just keeping in note that when you do return the foam inserts, you need to let the kitchen cool down because it will be hot after use. So most of the safety stuff that I've actually gone over in this video um, about the gas is actually written here on the side of your camper. So if you do ever get stuck, there is a little bit of a note here. We're now gonna move on to the operation of the sink. So, you're looking for your drain hose. It's located in the first drawer, along with all the other important stuff for your camper. With the drain hose, you will notice it is actually a two-bit piece. You've got the screw-on bit, which has a rubber seal, and the push-on hose extendable part. Insert the rubber seal into the screw-on piece, just like this. And then all you do is screw this piece on, get it on there nice and tight, once you do that, just extend this into a bucket. 
Um, just want to make a quick note here is do not leave the screw on piece attached to the bottom of your kitchen because if you notice the opening of the kitchen is not quite big enough to fit it through and you will do some damage. So now we're going to look at the tap. The tap is plumbed to the onboard water tank which is controlled by the pump which you need to turn on via the power management system. Once you do that, all you do is turn the handle. As you can see, you've got an inbuilt train plug. It's pretty easy to use. All you do is pull up the little gold thing and your water will release. To re-engage, just push down and it's sealed. Once you're finished with the kitchen, there are a few little important things I would like to note. Make sure you turn off the gas before you disconnect the bayonet hose. Once you remove the bayonet hose, it is important to replace the dust cap. That helps prevent any seals from being damaged. Make sure you disconnect the gray water hose, including the little screw-on attachment. Also, that the burners, including the grates, have cooled down before you insert the foam and slide the kitchen away. Now that you've put everything away on the kitchen, you now can release the brakes and slowly push it in. So all you do is push the blue tabs in and slowly push. Holding those tabs as you go until you get all the way in. Once you get in, all you do is push, turn, pull. Now that you know how to set up and open your camper, it's time to talk about how to look after it and maintain it for a longer lifespan. Now firstly, let's talk about your canvas. When you first get home, your first job is to weather the canvas. What does this mean? Weathering is a very simple process. All it involves is opening up your camper, setting it up and then hosing it down two or three times, allowing it to dry in the sun in between each time. Why do we do this? Well, with all canvases, when they are first made, the weaves might be a little bit loose. Wetting it and drying it allows those weaves to tighten up and give you the maximum weather protection that the canvas can provide. It's a very important step and we highly recommend you do it before your first trip. Should your tent get dirty, the best thing to use for spot cleaning is a soft bristle brush with cold water. Just that simple. Don't use any detergents, soaps, insecticides or anything else like that as this may reduce the quality of the water repellency of your tent. Now, in the event of mold or mildew, we recommend using simply water and vinegar to treat the stains. Now, you can also use mold or mildew removing products available from Bunnings or most camping stores, as these will work quite well as well. We also recommend that you regularly hose down your canvas. This is to stop dirt from embedding itself into your fibres and make sure that your canvas remains clean. Once a year, we also recommend that you add some new waterproofing spray, and this is available at Bunnings or most camping stores. Also, vacuum out your camper a lot. If there's little bits of food, scraps and things like that, this can become really enticing to insects and rats. And if they get inside your camper, they can severely damage the tent. And lastly, and this is a big one, never store your camper wet. I understand that sometimes it'll be raining and you need to pack down fast. However, the moment you get home and it dries up, open that camper up and let it dry out. This will reduce your risk of developing mold. Now, let's talk about the body of the camper. It's very important that you keep the body clean, as well as any seals or latches on the camper. It's really simple. We recommend just using a little bit of WD-40 on a rag and just lightly clean the camper. Also, use a little bit of WD-40 on your seals. This will greatly enhance the lifespan of them. Now it's time to talk about storing your camper. The best place, obviously, is in the garage, with your second best being a carport, and third, outside. Now, if you are storing it outside, we highly recommend the use of a camper trailer cover. The reason for this is we're trying to protect the camper from all sorts of industrial pollutants, tree sap, bird droppings, things like that, that could get onto the paint and damage the paint long term. Also, add in some moisture absorbers. You can buy these in boxes from Bunnings or many camping stores and put them inside the camper as well for prolonged storage. This will make sure that no moisture remains inside the camper and you risk any sort of mold developing. Unless you have opted for a battery upgrade, your camper trailer will come standard with a 100 amp hour AGM battery. When storing your camper short term, simply make sure that the power is turned off and if storing it for a longer period of time, you will need to charge it in maintenance mode through your charger at least once a month. 
You also have the option of just leaving it connected all the time, as today's smart chargers will take care of turning it on and off as needed for you. Now when it comes to battery usage, try not to let the battery ever drop below 12.2 volts. If it does, charge it immediately, as if you do this too often, it's going to damage the battery long term and it's going to reduce its lifespan. Now, if you have upgraded to one of our lithium battery options, you'll need to refer to the manufacturer's website and have a look at their maintenance tips. As with any vehicle, your camper trailer does require regular servicing. Your wheels and wheel bearings are exposed to a lot of wear and tear and need regular checking and re-greasing. And all the nuts and bolts on the camper may need a retalk after a while. Also, in the back of your manual, you'll find a service schedule. Now, it's very important to follow your service schedule as not doing so may result in your warranty not being valid anymore. So please make sure you get all the required services done. That brings us to the end of our Chase Camper Handover video. I hope you learned a lot and happy camping. See you on the trails, guys.